All right, we have another quadratic equation that is begging to be solved, okay? So we've been talking about completing the square, and so let's do that here. Now this one may be kind of messy, so if at any time you need to take a break, I, I understand. Let's go through that process that, that we have for completing the square. The first step is to move the constant term to the other side so that you have one side of the equation that is just for your variable terms. All right, so that is really no big deal. Move that 2 to the other side, leave some space there because you know you have to fill in some things later. Now the next step for completing the square is to make sure that we have a lead coefficient of 1. That means we have to divide by whatever we see here. Now, coming up, I'm going to say that if this step causes you to have fractions, don't complete the square and we'll talk about another method to use but right now this is what we have and I want you to see that completing the square is always going to work so we now have x squared plus 7 thirds x mm. is equal to negative 2 thirds alright well now we have to complete the square on that all right, so it's gonna be kind of gross, but it's going to be okay, and here's why. We know that I'm gonna put something here in the gap so that the left side here will factor as a square. And you guessed it, it's going to be a fraction. Well, how do I figure that out? Well, think about this. You need to take 7 thirds and divide it by two. Another way of saying divide by 2 is to do half of that. So you want to do 7 thirds times 1 half. So half of 7 thirds means you would have 7 over 6. So that's doing half of 7 thirds. It's really not too bad, right? So I'm going to put the half of that guy down here, so it's plus 7 over 6. Remember, you divide by 2, or you do half of that guy, but what goes in the gap is the square of this. So if I square 7 over 6, I end up with 49 over 36. Now by adding 49 over 36 to the left side, it allows me to factor the left side as a square, but I have to balance things out by adding 49 over 36 on the right side. All right, well, it's a good thing you know how to deal with fractions, right? So we have to add these guys. So that's another case of let's go off to the side and let's do some scratch work, right? So I need to take negative 2 thirds plus 49 over 36. My common denominator is, well, it's 36, so I need to multiply this by 12, so times 12, times 12. I get negative 24 over 36 plus 49 over 36, which gives me 25 over 36. All right, not the best looking number, but you're gonna see that it works out to be in our favor here in just a moment. So that's 25 over 36. All right, so we've created a square on the left side. We have something else on the right side, I don't really care, but now it's set up so that I can use the square root property. Remember. Completing the square is just a vehicle to get you to use the square root property. So let's take the square root of both the left side and the right side. Don't forget the plus or minus. All right, so when I take the square root of the square, I'm just left with x plus 7 over 6. On the right side, that's plus or minus. And you're going to see this works out very nicely because the square root of 25 is just 5, the square root of 36 is 6. All right, I'll take it. And now we want to move the 7 over 6 to the other side. And again, since you have the plus or minus in play, you need to make sure that you put the 7 over 6 in front of that. So x is equal to negative 7 over 6 plus or minus 5 over 6. Now before you box this, you need to slow down and pay attention. If I didn't have the plus or minus and I just had a plus, could you combine those two fractions? 
And the answer is yes. You don't have anything that's imaginary. You don't have anything that's radical. So that means these two guys can be combined, and for us to do that, we need to separate these guys, one with the plus and one with the negative. So you end up with this. X is equal to negative 7 over 6 plus 5 over 6. So it becomes negative 2 over 6, which is negative 1 third. This is one of our solutions. The other one is when you do the negative part. So negative 7 over 6 minus 5 over 6. We get negative 12 over 6 which is negative 2. And when you look at these two solutions, although one of them is a fraction, they are very nice numbers. They're both rational. And since these guys are both rational, what that means is that at the very beginning of this problem, I could have solved this equation by factoring. This is why I stressed you how important factoring is, because it can save us a lot of time. So let me go back to that original problem and show you how easy this guy could have been if we had just been paying attention. So when it comes to solving a quadratic equation, there's a certain progression that you need to follow. The first thing you look for is, can you use the square root property? Meaning, is x only present in one term? Well, you have two terms that contain x, so the answer is no. I cannot use the square root property. The second thing that we try to do is to use the zero factor theorem. In other words, will this polynomial factor? Well, let's take a moment to see. To see if this factors, do three times two. So let's try to do the AC method. So A times C is going to be three times two, which equals six. And are there factors of six that are going to add to seven? And yes you would use the factors one and six. So that means I can split up that middle term to say three x squared plus x plus six x plus two equals zero. Now I'm showing the AC method because that seems to be a pretty common thing for students to use. Um, I personally use a combination of several different methods to, to factor. But you use whatever works for you and is valid and correct. So in this first group, a common factor is x. I'm left with 3x plus 1. In the second group, you begin with a plus. The common factor for 6 and 2 is 2. Factor that out, and I have 3x plus 1. And we can finish the factoring by grouping. So we have 3x plus 1 times x plus 2. And to finish using that zero factor theorem, that means that 3x plus 1 is equal to 0, or x plus 2 is equal to 0. Solving this, x equals negative 1 third or x equals negative 2. The exact same two answers that we got the first time. Only here, the only time you ran into a fraction was at the very end, when you were dividing by 3, right? As opposed to all of the fraction work that we had to do up above. So, the moral of the story is take the time to see if this polynomial will factor, because if it can factor, it's going to be much easier than using a lot of the other methods that we have. It's faster, it's cleaner. Yeah, so that's my recommendation to you. Now we have one more to do, just to kind of be a palate cleanser here for you. So let's look at solving this one. x squared plus 18x plus 181 equals 0. Remember that at any time, feel free to pause the video and try to work it out on your own, and then come back and see how you did. All right, so if we go through the progression like we talked about, 
the first thing you try to see is can you use the square root property? Well, you've got two instances of x, so the answer here is no. The second thing you try to do is to use the zero factor theorem. Well, you've got a lead coefficient of 1, so you would focus on the 181 and try to find factors of this that add to 18. Are there factors of 181 that add to 18? And the answer is no. So this guy doesn't factor. Well, what comes next in this you know, quadratic equation progression? Well, we have CTS, completing the square. So how do we know that completing the square is a good thing for us? You know it's good when the lead coefficient is 1, or it can easily become 1, and you want this middle coefficient to be even, right? So the first thing is to make sure this is a 1. It is. This guy's even. Perfect. Completing the square is the best thing we have for us. So to complete the square, as we have shown, you are first going to move that 181 to the other side. So it was a positive over here, it becomes a negative on the right side. We now have to figure out what goes in the gap so that we can then factor the left side as a square. All right? Remember the process. Divide this by 2, so that's 9, and then you square this to fill in the gap right here. Okay. Now, whenever you do half of this number, that sign is going to carry down. So if it's a plus, this guy's going to be a plus. If it's negative, it's going to be a negative. However, when you square that, whether you square a positive or a negative, it's always going to be a plus that you have right here. Now, I added 81. I must maintain balance in my equa equation by adding 81 to the other side. All right, so on the right side, we combine these combine these guys to get negative 100. So we did some manipulating. We now have an equation that is perfect for us to use the square root property. We only have x in one term. It's inside of the square. Plus or minus because we are the ones who are putting the square root in the problem. Alright, so this is x plus 9 is equal to plus or minus. The square root of 100 is 10, and the square root of the negative gives us i. One final step to get x by itself, and that is to subtract 9. So x is equal to negative 9 plus or minus 10i. Now, completing the square is not the only way we have for solving this. There's one more method that we can use. However, applying that method to this problem is going to be much more cumbersome with much larger numbers than we would like, but it can still be done. And that method is something we're going to be talking about in the next video.